Okay. Um, I have done uh, talks to the general public uh, regularly for the last probably 13 years, and um, uh, they're generally like the general public. I've got a feeling there's a lot of extraordinarily knowledgeable people in the world of automotive engineering and understanding things. So I'll carry on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, so. To put it in a little bit of context, uh, I, as was mentioned very kindly, I used to present a, a TV show called uh, Scrap, Scrap Heap Challenge in America, Junkyard Wars. And what, what, it was when I was filming in the United States in, from 2001 to 2006, we, we made uh, 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 the, exactly the same format show called Junkyard Wars. And I will admit right now that I got paid quite a lot of money to stand on the top of a load of busted up American cars with, um, with glitter bombs going off, fireworks, smoke machines, and dancers dressed as engineers. I can't tell you what that really means, but it meant that there were sort of young dancers in boiler suits with knee pads, and that was how engineers dressed. You all know that. That's how <laughs> standard dress for an engineer. And they did a dance routine, and then the camera on a big, this was pre-drones and everything, a big, big arm came round, swung round over them, and it came up to me, and I had to say, in Britain, it's a challenge. In America, it's a war. <laughs> I got paid to do that. Humiliating, disgraceful, very, very embarrassing. But anyway, while I was there, um, I, I became aware, and I wasn't the slightest bit interested, but I became aware of, of a movement within, specifically in California and very specifically in Los Angeles, about clean air, about combustion engines and particulates and all that stuff. So all those things that we now we're all aware of catalytic converters, unleaded petrol. All those things came from California. That's where they were invented. So there was this organization, government organization in California called the Californian Air Resource Board, or CARB as it's known. Its big supporter was Arnie when he was the governor. And he was pushing for cleaner vehicles and cleaner air. Because in the Los Angeles Basin, which is huge, is a uh, massive, you, some of you will know it, but you know, massive uh, network of huge highways, six, eight lane highways, millions of cars, literally millions of cars. And of course, at that time, the first time I went to Los Angeles, early 1980s, every car was basically did between four and five miles to the gallon, had a massive V8 engine, and we're going up two miles an hour on these highways, just barely crawling on, huge clouds of toxic gas coming out the back. And all the research into children's health that were at schools that were generally in poor neighborhoods right next to the, the highway, they suffered, old people were dying of you know, lung diseases. It was not a good thing. It's what we've seen replicated in places like Mumbai and, and Beijing and Shanghai. And so they wanted to clean the air. And that's where the notion of either zero emissions or ultra low emission vehicles came from. So it's where the Prius was built for Los Angeles. It's where General Motors made the EV1, an electric car, a long time ago. And, uh, you know, there's a whole other long story of that. So I gradually became aware of that while I was in Los Angeles. But it still didn't make me go... Oh, electric cars, aren't they cool? Mm. I wasn't interested at all. When I first went in an electric car, I just want to tell you how I got to the location. We were filming monster trucks in Ventura Raceway, which is about 20 miles north of Los Angeles. And it's a drag strip and a, and a kind of a stock car track and a raceway. And we were filming these monster trucks that the teams had built, the American teams had built these things. So the absolute perfect antithesis of a fuel-efficient eco... <laughs> tree hugging car one of them did a, it did a mile to the gallon it, it, it used a gallon every mile it had a seven and a half liter v8 from some truck or something and huge tires and just the most stupid thing but it was great fun very noisy very dirty really great and next to this was a drag strip and on the drag strip was this little yellow car that was racing porsches and ferraris and muscle cars and i don't even know what it was nothing to do with us. We weren't involved with it. But at the lunchtime, while I was having, sitting in the shade, really, really hot day, these very excited engineers came over, and they loved Junkyard Wars. And they went, oh, Robert, we really want you to go in our car. It'd be great. Can you go and have it? And I was going, oh, God. And the producer said, oh, go on. Just go. It won't take long. Oh, God, all right. So I went and saw this, like a kit car, a little yellow two-seater sports car with a little roll bar. It looked a bit weak. 
and there was a tr the driver, I'm not making this up, the driver was called Randy. And I just, you know, we're British, we're going <laughs> to... But the problem was that Randy, very friendly, big Californian guy, got in the car, I had to put on a flame-proof suit, neck brace, full-face helmet, five-point harness in like, God knows how top, like 35 degrees centigrade. Bright sunshine, just really, but Randy sat next to me and he called me Bob. And that's fine, there's nothing wrong, it's Robert, Bob, it's short for Bob. It's just that when I was a kid, Uncle Bob was not allowed to babysit. Let's just leave that there. <laughs> Funny he never married, as my dad always said. So Uncle Bob was always kept at an arm's length from the kids. Anyway, so I was a bit uncomfortable being called Bob. So I'm sitting there waiting for the absolute traditional vroom, 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 all that stuff, nothing. I could hear birds tweeting and suddenly, honestly, it felt like my eyeballs went down the side of my head because this thing just shot off like a bullet down this drag strip and it was an electric car. What the T, it was called the T, T0, it was the T0 because I was talking about it earlier to John, it's not the T2 because that came later and the T2 exploded. The T0 was really good and it was a battery electric car. The first time I ever went in one, uh, it had Sanyo laptop batteries in a box in the back, a wooden box, beautifully done, not like Scrappy, very nicely, you know, they'd spent time doing it, wired it all together. A desktop computer, I don't know what type, but one of those big old desktop computers like we used to have that was wearing away, and that was the battery maintenance, battery management and engine management system, was the software was running on that. All they were testing was the drivetrain, which was made by a company called AC Propulsion, electric motor, going through a small uh, gear thing, differential um, to, to, to the back axle. And that's what they were actually testing. I would think this car had a range of probably five miles, you know, it was, but all it needed to do was go a quarter of a mile up a drag strip ridiculously fast. So it was a sub three second zero to 60 speed vehicle. It was pretty unpleasant to be in. The suspension was probably, I would say, rudimentary. And the seating was just a plastic thing. It was horrible. But I was, you know, it was, I was intrigued, but I wasn't like, oh, this is it. This is the future. Because what I forgot to mention <laughs> is that the, the way I got to that uh, uh, location that day was in a 1969 mint condition, bottle green, fastback Ford Mustang. And I was, that was the, the sound engineer owned it. It was in immaculate condition. It was just spotless. He'd refurbished it, done everything to it, and he wanted me to buy it. And he wanted me to buy it and take it back to the UK. You'll love it, Bob. Don't call me Bob. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and there, I love this car, and it was brilliant. And I drove it up the highway, and it's great. If you're in Amer on an American highway in one of those cars, and it's nice, long, straight road, <laughs> it's just wonderful. If you've got to go around a corner, well, you just don't bother because they're just shit at road hold. They are so bad. They are so bad. But in a straight line, they're great. And I stopped at traffic lights and revved it like an English pillock. Vroom! Because the whole thing would vroom, would twist when you revved. I just loved doing that. So that's what I was into. So this little electric, it sounded like a vacuum cleaner. It was very unimpressive. But slowly, I guess I heard more and more about this. I, could, I heard about uh, Tesla. This is pre-Elon Musk. Tesla was founded by actual engineers who could actually build cars as opposed to a psychotic... <laughs> and a very, very creative and, and, and important man who will be remembered in history uh, for numerous things. But, you know, he did... He, they, the Tesla would not exist today without Elon Musk. We have to acknowledge that. So that started to happen. And then in about 2009... I, through contacts that I had uh, in the automotive industry, I heard that the, there was a, a, a scheme in, the, in Birmingham and they wanted, I think it was 32 people, to drive a Mitsubishi iMe for a year and see and have your, your you'd have a special meter on your, in your garage to see how much electricity you use and you, it was a three pin plug to charge it. So, the, so it was myself and Quentin Wilson who used to be on top gear. Well, what there were two of those 30 people. The rest were proper normal people. They were just two poncy TV presenters. Um, so we both had these little electric cars, and they were really weird. I quite liked it. Uh, the iMeve is a, a traditionally a, a, a Japanese urban car. It was a, originally a petrol car. They could, Mitsubishi converted it to, uh, to an electric drive. Actually, very well. There's still some around. They're, they're very, very narrow, but really easy to park. Brilliant in the snow, bizarrely. Because I live in the Cotswolds, quite high up, and when it does snow, when it used to snow in the olden days, doesn't anymore, but when it used to, might be fatal last words, it might snow tonight and I won't get home. But 
I, I drove out in the Mitsubishi. I had a Prius and a Mitsubishi. The Prius, the one, as soon as the tyres touched the snow, I think they, were, they had a meeting inside the Prius. And they, they were quarrelled, and they decided, no way are we going out in that. It's much easier. So it just went, and it was like nothing. You press the throttle, nothing. There wasn't any noise. There was no, it just would not go. That snow was too much. So I got in the little, little I-Beave, reversed out into the snow, and went, God, this is moving. Rear wheel drive, oh, there we go. It turned itself out into the road. Jim, who is our proper, you know, I live in the Cotswolds. Yes, it's true, there are some hedge fund managers with helicopters. There are some TV presenters. Yes, there's some people like that. But most people are normal. And Jim is normal. He does dry stone walling. He trims hedges. He delivers logs. And he drives a Land Rover. He drove past me and went, oh, wait, Robert, you fucking idiot. And like that, he drove past in his Land Rover. I drove out, and my wheels went into the ruts made by the Land Rover. And I just followed him. I'm like, this, look, a Land Rover gets through the snow, and so does my little Mitsubishi. He turned off down the village to his house. I was going straight ahead to the shops. No, the car just went like that. <laughs> it followed Jim. I ended up at Jim's house. I said, I'm sorry, something I can do. <laughs> it was like a train. It was extraordinary. But it did it. Anyway, that's a very silly story. Never ran out. Drove it for a year. Had it, did about 9,500 miles in the year. Uh, there was no charging infrastructure. I love it when people talk about, well, the, the charging infrastructure isn't up to scratch. Try none. <laughs> I drove it all over the place. I went to a farm in Wales, which is so stupid, and I knocked on the door and I said, look, I'm really sorry, but I can't, I can't get home. I need to plug my car in. And they just looked at me like, what is this weird bloke? What's he doing? So I drove it into their barn, and I had loads of cables and different ways of plugging it in, because of the, which is from the crew of Red Dwarf, who gave me lots of different cable connectors, which was very useful. So I plugged it into a commando socket and charged it quite quickly or topped it up enough to get home but that was charging infrastructure there was one rapid charger in the UK at the Mitsubishi headquarters in Sirencester it was behind a lock gate you had to ring them up to get access I'd drive it in there I'd film it going this is how a rapid charger works plug it in didn't work all the instructions were in Japanese and no one at Mitsubishi could speak Japanese or read Japanese <laughs> utterly utterly hopeless that was charging infrastructure in 2009 um, but then something sp sparked. I just remember what it is. <laughs> so Tesla by then had re uh, released the Tesla Roadster, which was the first sort of semi-plausible electric vehicle, I think. It did have a range of about 220 miles, just over 200 miles. It was very, very fast, two-seater sports car, really uncomfortable, um, based on a, a Lotus. And they lent me a, one of these. So I filmed an episode called fully charged the fully charged show and we put it on youtube and i thought well nobody will watch that and uh some people did but still very few and i was kind of going through the rudimentary arguments about why it might be sensible to try and change the way we use cars uh you know i wasn't i think i've been accused of being evangelical more recently but then i really was going I'm not sure this really works, because there was nowhere to charge the Tesla, the, the Tesla showroom, or um, uh, T-Bay services in Cumbria. <laughs> Those were the two places you could charge a Tesla Roadster. Uh, so, you know, really early days. Um, but, I mean, an impressive car, uh, really nice car. It was just, I, just very uncomfortable to drive for any distance. Uh, and also I had to get, when I finally took it back into London, I had two, two young men who worked for Tesla had to help me out of the car. I couldn't get out. It's a very, it's like a rich, so, you know, there's some gentlemen here of a similar age, you know, after a long drive, <laughs> it can be quite difficult to get out of a very low sports car with a low... <laughs> so that was a little bit difficult. But then that show started to kind of grow. I then drove, the second car I ever drove was the Honda Clarity, which was a hydrogen fuel cell car, really interesting car. I was, uh, again, with Quentin Wilson, strangely, but the two of us flew out to Germany to try that car. Um, amazing machine, beautiful car to drive. Uh, and that, it kind of grew and grew. So then, uh, it's grown. So in case you don't know, I'll explain now, but a fully charged show is, has a, well, just over a million and a bit uh, subscribers. We get about a million views a week on the channel. Um, uh, last month we got five million in a month, so a little bit over a million. We have we do live shows all over the world. We've just done one in Amsterdam last weekend, 
the next one is in Sydney and Australia. These are huge events now. They've grown enormously. The most recent UK one was in Farnborough, at Farnborough Airfield. We had 45,000 visitors, which is amazing. It is an extraordinary event. Hundreds, we do thousands of test drives at that one. So hundreds of manufacturers have their cars on display and they've got rows of them there. You can take them out for a test drive. And there's a few facts I want to tell you about what's happened in the, the last, I've got, kind of find it down to the last 10 years, so from 2013 to the present day, to see how much things have changed, because it's difficult to keep, keep, uh, keep a grip on this stuff. But in 2013, there were 130,000 electric cars on the roads of the world, 130,000, of which 3,700 were in the UK. So there was, 2013, you know, there was, you would see an electric car every now and then. Today, there's 100 million electric cars on the road. This is pure electric, not plug-in hybrids, not hybrids. This is battery electric cars. 100 million, 1,450,000 in the UK. So there's now 1.5 million electric cars in this country. I was staggered when I look, looked all this up. One of the great advantages we have is we, have, we work with a company, with a group called um, Our World in Data, who are based in Oxford and Edinburgh. So proper, clever, non-partisan <laughs> well-educated young people who do research for us. So these figures are from them. Uh, this one is very, very interesting and critically important. The cost of making a, a one kilowatt hour of a battery pack. So this is the, the entire thing, the battery pack, the finished pack, not the, just the cells. The cost of making that in 2013 was $1,750 per kilowatt hour. So you imagine if you've got an 80 kilowatt hour battery, that is a staggering cost, which is the cost of the early Tesla Model S, was, explains a lot about that. Today, 2023, the most recent, which is from Cattle, C-A-T-L, which is a Chinese battery maker, is $97.20 per kilowatt hour. So it's dropped from 1,750 to 97. That is an incredible change. That is very similar to solar panels, which 20 years ago cost a fortune. If you go back to when I was a kid and when some of us were kids, solar panels were tens of thousands of pounds each because they were used by NASA to generate power for satellites and spaceships. So those prices, when you look at them in graphs, they just go, they just fall off the cliff. Uh, £97.20 20 per kilowatt hour is, has long been cited as the tipping point. Once batteries cost less than $100 a kilowatt hour to make, the cost of making a new electric car is cheaper than making a new petrol car, regardless of anything else. Now, we're not going to see that in this country <laughs> for a long time, if ever. However, you now can buy a four-seater electric car in Japan that has a 150-mile range, so I'll say a limited range, for £5,500 equivalent. £5,000. If you see a picture of the car, it looks perfectly acceptable. It doesn't look like shit. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. There's no polite way of saying it. Um, so the month of September 2023, this year, 17% of all new car registrations were electric vehicles, with 45,323 new electric cars registered in one month. So what we're seeing, basically, is the, the beginnings of the, the, the adoption curve. It is going up. Now, loads of other factors are involved in this um, because that is faltering. And that, there's no such thing as a smooth curve. So when people project, this is what it's going to be like when the iPhone comes out, it's, going, it's always like that because there's other factors. There's really difficult financial situation that we're all in. So there's lots of people now who might buy an electric car or release one, a new one, but they can't because they haven't got the money and it's too expensive to, to buy any car. You know, you're going to stick with what you've got. Um, but one of the aspects I think we don't think about, because certainly we keep reminding ourselves within the company, that it's not just cars, it's not just private cars. So as of the end of August 2023, there were more than 46,000 electric vans in use by companies in the UK. So a huge increase in, in vans. Now, some of you may know about this, but in the Exeter Amazon fulfillment centre, so one of their big warehouses, they only have electric vans, they're out all day delivering stuff, they come back, they charge them, they go out again, all that stuff. At night, they, they charge them, 
They come back, not empty, but they have only have a small amount of electricity in them. They're all plugged into bi-directional, so i.e. the electricity can go either way out of the vehicle. They run the entire machinery of that huge building from the vans for about three hours at peak time after, you know, and they've got hundreds of them. So the, the, the total amount of electricity they get out of them is enough to run all the robots and all the lighting and all the heating and everything else that's going on in the building. Then they charge them in the middle of the night when their electricity is really cheap, or they charge them in the day off their massive solar array that's on the roof of the building. And this is the first time this has really been done at this scale in the UK. It's been done a lot in the United States. And what the, the reason I'm mentioning it is because this is nothing to do with tree hugging, virtue signaling, uh, holier than thou. This is economics. The people who run those fleets have spreadsheets. They look at how much they spent running 50, 150 diesel trucks, vans. They look at how much they spend running 150 electric ones. The electric ones are cheaper. That's why they're using them. And there's no other reason at all. Uh, there's 2,330 electric buses in the UK. I didn't know that. That's a lot. Much more than I thought. There are 90 hydrogen fuel cell buses in the UK, mostly in London. As at the end of September 2023, there were 49,882 public electric vehicle rapid charging points across the UK at 29,709 charging locations. I just want to say that is more than there was when I was driving a Mitsubishi iMeve. <laughs> Because I absolutely accept, you know, the charging infrastructure isn't ready for 2030. No, it isn't, because it's not 2030, it's 2023. Um, a huge, huge increase in charging. I'm not going to just do boring figures, but just let me, bear with me for a minute. Uh, so, there was, okay, there was a 43% increase in the total number of charging devices since September of last year. So in one year, we've added 46%. 43%, beg your pardon. Uh, back in 2013... The fastest rapid charger that had ever been made could deliver 50 kilowatts. Oof, that's a lot. <laughs> and that would, that would add, say, about 300 miles per hour of range, which is no way you'd ever use it because the cars that used it didn't have 300 miles of range. But that was the speed at which they were adding miles. Now they are uh, the latest, there's a huge number of chargers that, uh, charge at 350 kilowatts and the latest Tesla superchargers that any car can use they're not just for Teslas are capable of 500 kilowatts and that seems to be the target that people want 500 kilowatts and that is adding about three and a half thousand miles range in an hour so you're talking about 15 10 to 15 minutes adds a couple of hundred miles so it's a completely different paradigm I just want to quickly point out that I use rapid chargers once a month, and I drive an enormous amount in electric cars, once, maybe twice a month. I do not use them very often. And I think this is the difficult thing to understand if you've never driven an electric car. It's a different, it's a different approach. My main aim when I drive an electric car is not to wait and to do something else while it's charging. Generally, that's sleeping or having a wee, because <laughs> you have to do the two together, don't you? At my age, constantly... Try not to do it when you're in the bed. I've learned that. <laughs> do get up. That's what my wife keeps telling me. She's so fussy. Um, but yeah, so that, so uh, what I, I think, I, don't, I just made, made this note, because what are the challenges? Because I've now quickly say, which of course I've completely forgotten, is that there's two halves. I'll talk now about what I've experienced, but then we'll have a little interval, and there's mince pies apparently. And then. Um, and then uh, I'd love to ask, answer questions, because that's often the most fun bit, because I won't know what you want to know. And I probably won't know the answer, but I'll come up with something stupid. Uh, so grid infrastructure. Here's some, this, is, this is across the board. Uh, I was at a conference in Oxford that I'm very uh, privileged to go to, the Aora Energy Conference at Oxford University. Um, really proper people on the panels. They let me do one in the end of the day about electric ground transport. Uh, but they have really problems. So they have like government ministers and CEOs of companies. And I heard about a solar farm that had planning permission, local support because local people had invested in it, all the technology they needed. It had huge battery stuff. Da 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 da. They are waiting. They have to wait until 2036 for a grid connection. 2036. 
that doesn't work. <laughs> and this, that's a solar farm, but the same thing applies to a large charging hubs where you have 50 and 60 chargers in a, in a motorway services or at a, at a retail park or something like that, which is what we need. It's that kind of level we need. And when you do see it, you go, oh, okay, that works. So I've been to a charging hub in California that has 180 rapid chargers under a massive solar canopy. And when you drive into that, you go, oh, right. Loads of them were in use. So it wasn't like I did find a, an empty stall. 180 chargers is the kind of, when you're on a motorway with loads of cars, that's what you've got to have. And the infrastructure behind that is mind boggling. That's a, a small city in terms of energy use if all those uh, uh, chargers are, are being used. So there are, as now, legislation going through the Parliament to allow private companies to pay for the spur, the extra uh, connection that they need to put in to allow that to happen. And the companies, this guy who runs this company, Octopus Energy, you might know him, Greg Jackson, you may have heard of him, amazing guy. He said the, 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 the last problem we have, the least problem we have is raising the money. <laughs> the money is easy. That's really easy. It's getting permission. It's the, it's the bureaucracy of the way the grid was designed. The grid was designed for big power stations over there, and you generate all the electricity, it goes down to big pylons, and it goes to a substation, and it goes to little substations, and then it goes to your house, and that's the way it goes. That's how we built our grid. It makes complete sense. But what we're doing now is, down the end of there, there's Dave, Rodney, and Phil, and probably Uncle Bob, all got solar panels, and they're sending electricity the other way, and it doesn't, you know, we've got a lot to do. So I think the massive challenge we've got is modifying our grid. This applies around the world. It's not just in this country. A huge... Um, huge challenge that is one of the ways that we're getting around it so uh, uh, which services is it's near High Wycombe one of the motorway services on the M40 there's a load of charges there they had no uh, ability to get the power to it what they've done is put a huge battery pack four megawatt hour battery pack in big containers just behind the the car park behind a fence those are charging all the time on a much lower feed than they can fit in and that, so when you plug your car in, you're taking on that electricity out of that battery. The battery is operating as a buffer. One of the advantages, though, that the company that put that in is they can buy electricity when it's really cheap at night, and they can sell it when it's really expensive. They are making a metric shit ton of money out of doing that. And as soon as that happens, there's other people from hedge funds and investment funds who go, Oh, I think we should get one of those batteries. They're really bloody good. So uh, GridServe, uh, you may have heard of, if, uh, they have a big charging hub outside Braintree in Essex, and that makes it covers its costs with all the people that come in and charge it. It's got a shop, it's got toilets, it's got nice Wi-Fi, very lovely. Uh, so it doesn't lose money, but where they're making the money is from the battery, which is huge, which is behind a fence. You don't see it if you don't know it's there. And that has the capacity to charge trucks. So they have... Uh, very high capacity truck charges as well. Um, I've just got to talk about Utrecht. Please bear with me, because Utrecht is such an extraordinary example of what can happen to a city. There's a great photograph in the centre of Utrecht which shows the main street in Utrecht in 1972. It's jam-packed with cars. It's a massive traffic jam. It's full of cars. There's people walking down a narrow uh, pavement at the side. Uh, but it's all cars. And if you go to the same place now, there's no cars at all. Absolutely none. There's no cars allowed there. There's a tram line that goes through it. There's a wonderful cycle path that's part of their cycle highway that, has, that goes from one side of the big canal to, to the centre of Utrecht. There's no cars that are allowed on it. You feel very safe cycling on it. It has its own suspension bridge. <laughs> a suspension bridge built for bicycles. It's a very different attitude. At the train station... There is a multi-storey bicycle park where you can leave something like 80,000 bikes either side of the rail line. So thousands of people cycle in there every day and catch the train. So a lot of people commute from uh, Utrecht to either Rotterdam or Amsterdam. It's quite close. When you see that and you go, oh, that is quite nice. It's a very different atmosphere of a city. I, I think Utrecht is probably about the same size as Leicester or Coventry. It's that sort of scale of city. It's not huge. They also do the most amazing car sharing scheme. Uh, called, the company is called We Drive Solar. They've installed, now it is, I've just seen them this last weekend, 800 of their electric cars. They're all electric cars. 800 of their cars are bi directional capable. Um, 
So they have their own dedicated parking space. It was scattered all over the city. Uh, each one has a, a post next to where you park the car. So you know you can always park the car because nothing else is allowed to park there. The car you're using has got that space. That's where you take it back to. And when you plug it in, the electricity can go either way. So that's controlled by the company. They are making money out of that because they will do exactly the same thing as Amazon are doing with their electric vans. They'll charge them up at night on cheap electricity. Some people drive them that day, some people don't. Maybe the, the batteries are nearly full. They will then use that electricity from 800 cars. They take one kilowatt. One kilowatt hour out of 800 cars is actually quite a lot. And that helps run the city. They're working towards getting up to 10,000 cars. Once they've got 10,000 cars, that city can be run from cars for a couple of hours. It's not all day. It's not trying to replace everything else. But it means at peak time, when every generator has to be turned on, and this is the same, although so they will use gas like we do here, you don't need to do that. You use the cars. And that's the first clue I've had where you can really see the beginnings of this completely different uh, relationship with cars and the way we use them and how how kind of crazy, the more you see that, the more you think, well, the way we do things now is kind of bonkers because it is, it is basically the statistics are 95% of the time we own a car, we don't use it, which is quite, I think, I'm not good at maths, but 95% sounds like more than half. It's the most absurd relationship. And if you think of something like an airline and they've got 500 airplanes, but they only use them for 5% of the time they own them, they would be bankrupt in 10 minutes. You know, it's kind of, what are we doing? We just litter our sit towns and cities with, with cars that aren't moving. And it just, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have an answer, because I grew up with them like you did, and it's normal, and that's how we operate. But when you start to see patterns of maybe different behaviour, so one of the people we interviewed in Utrecht was a university-educated, middle-class, well-paid couple who used to have a Tesla Model X. And they, they, we like electric cars, they're very nice, because the children like it in the back, because it goes fast, and all that stuff. We had all the fun about making fun of Dutch accents. I shouldn't do it, but it's quite good fun. Um, <laughs> and they had sold their Model X because using the car-sharing scheme was a better experience. That's how they said it. It was better. They have access to a Renault Zoe, just right outside their house, if they want to go to the shops. They have access to an Ionic 5, if there's a bigger car and they want to go to another town. If they want to go on holiday in the summer, they can hire a Tesla Model, Model 3, which is in the big car park at the, in the centre of town. There was 80 of them. There are 80 Tesla Model 3s. We didn't see this. It's such a shame we weren't there. We were there just afterwards. The mayor of Utrecht had held a special event for people from South Korea, from the United States, from Canada, from Australia... Uh, from uh, city councillors and transport planners, and they come to see what Utrecht had done. And she was very proud. She said, open the gates. This is the big car park, and these are all the Teslas. And they opened the gates. There was nothing. It was completely empty. And then she went, what? Where are all the Teslas gone? She said, What's happened? And so one of her assistants got out his iPad, and he went through, and they can track where all the cars are, and their Teslas mapped the south of France, mm -hmm. the coast of the south of France. That's where everyone had taken them on holiday. It was in August. And that's when Dutch people drive down to the south of France to get a bit of sunshine. So, you know, they work. People love it. People like using it. But when you get back home with your Tesla and you get all your bags out and you put it back in the car park and you plug it in, you don't have to worry about that car. It's not yours. You don't have to insure it or service it or make sure the tyres are OK. Or do it. They do that for you. It costs a lot of money to hire that Tesla for a week or two weeks. But you don't do it all the time. You only do it for that time. And they all have accounts. And if you plug the car in, you get discounts. And if you... You know, there's lots of ways of doing it. It's all done on an app. and you, I don't know. It's clever. Young people work it out, and it works. So that's, I will shut up about Utrecht, but it is an interesting example. So, I mean, I think the question I want to ask <laughs> is, are fossil fuels bad? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, when people comment on YouTube, which they do sometimes... A little bit annoyed. Uh, you know, with your fancy electric cars, the batteries are filthy. The making an electric car is ten times dirtier than a diesel car. You know, blah, 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 blah. You know, all, you've heard them all. And I just say, look, honestly, let's try this out. I'll, I'll get two containers, shipping containers. I'll park them in a car park. You come in your diesel car. I'll come in my electric car. I'll drive into one of the containers, shut the door, seal it. I'll sit in there with everything turned on. You do the same. Literally five minutes. <laughs> Five minutes, that's it. 
You drive there, engine ticking over, don't do anything else, then we'll get out and we'll have a chat about it. Except we won't because you'll be dead, and so I don't want you to do it. That is how clean clean diesel is. That is how untoxic fossil fuels are. I mean, we, we're all used to them, we've grown up with them. I used to fill my, my golf with petrol and sniff because I like the smell. That is a carcinogenic gas that's coming off. But I thought it was really cool. But then, so what? Because then I'd fill the cap up, get in the car, and light a cigarette. So, you know, can't really, claim, can't really blame them. I don't smoke anymore. Um, so I think we have to consider the, the, the downside of using fossil fuel. For a start, if nothing else, we import, I don't know how much of it, about 90% of it, mostly I, bloody Norwegians. Can I talk about Norway just for a bit? They're so lucky. They've all got electric cars. They've got renewable energy, because they always did have, because they've got masses of mountains. There's only 5 million of them. They're so smug. <laughs> they're so holier than thou. They all think they're brilliant. And they sell all their gas and oil to us. And we give them millions of pounds every day. Every day we give them that. And there's a sovereign wealth fund. Everyone, everyone, from a tiny newborn baby to a 99-year-old woman, has £250,000 in their sovereign wealth fund. It's their money. Bastards. <laughs> Where did all the money go that we got from North Sea Oil? I don't really know. I certainly don't have 250 grand in my account, which is... I don't know. Some people probably have more. Um, uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that sales of petrol and diesel have dropped. It's measurably, they've measurably reduced, mainly in the south of England, to be honest, and around uh, Harrogate, where we do a, a fully charged live show. It's more electric cars in Harrogate than you can possibly imagine. It's, it's more than in Norway. It's an extraordinary little bubble of electric... Uh, virtue signalling. Um, but so there, there has been a measurable drop in the amount of, uh, of, of fossil fuels that we've burnt because there's one and a half million electric cars. So all those people aren't buying diesel or petrol anymore. And yet we still burnt 2.42 2 billion litres of uh, petrol and diesel in September. 2.42 billion litres. That is insane. That is bonkers. It's got to be bonkers, surely, because a lot of that money went to Saudi. And they're lovely people. The people of Saudi are lovely, possibly the regime, a little bit murdery. Uh, you, could be, you could be a bit critical of them. Uh, there's two other topics that I think are really worth mentioning. I'll do hydrogen first, because a lot of people go, hydrogen is the future. That's a very common thing, and I pray that it will be, and hydrogen has a vitally, I think, a vitally critically important role in, in certain niche industries, certainly uh, stainless steel, if you know, there's now a stainless steel factory that's functioning for about a year in Sweden that makes really high-grade surgical uh, quality stainless steel, it doesn't use any coal, it only uses hydrogen and electricity to make it. So it can be done, but the hydrogen is critically important in that. There are uh, very advanced plans for long-term energy storage using hydrogen. Sounds like a good idea. I've driven three hydrogen fuel cell cars. They were all lovely to drive. The Hyundai Nexo, the Toyota Mirai, and the Honda Clarity. And they were so complicated, so expensive. There was nowhere to fill them up. It, it's a huge journey to get from from where we are with battery electric cars to where we could be with hydrogen fuel cell cars. If I was cycling down a busy street in a city and a hydrogen fuel cell car went past me, I'd be very, very happy. Much happier than if a diesel car goes past me and I have to breathe in what that's farting out the back. So I'd still prefer, I would love hydrogen fuel cell cars to work. I just don't see cars working. And it's possible shipping, but I think that seems to be ammonia. It's possible aircraft. We have in interviewed uh, a couple of companies that are developing hydrogen fuel cell aircraft, uh, which makes sense. Um, so they're electric uh, motors that spin the propellers. These are prop aircraft. There's a twin engine one, a couple of twin engine ones that are being developed at the moment that are already flying. And they can do sort of four, or 500 miles on, on tanks of hydrogen. But the tanks are big. Mu it's a much bigger thing than liquid fuel. We're so used to liquid fuel. It's such a dense, super energy uh, compact fuel that we've all grown up with and relied on. We've all benefited from burning fossil fuel. It's been amazing. It's transformed the world. 
it is, it's really important to acknowledge that, but it does feel like, it really feels like we're at the beginning, the really the dirty little scratchy beginning where things, we're going to get things wrong, but it's just starting to emerge that there is the possibility of, not, of burning less in the next 10 to 20 years. And I think we, we're always going to be using fossil fuel, I think, because there's so many other uh, reasons we use it, so many other products we get from it, pharmaceuticals and plastics and fertilisers. There's so many things we get from it. And it's just whether there are now, there is now talk, for the first time I've heard in the last couple of years, talk in, within the refining industry that we can, ref, we can use crude oil and refine it and not produce gasoline or diesel or jet fuel that you can still get the products you need out of it. A completely different way of refining it. And that's way, way above my very meagre pay grade to understand that. Although I've spent three days filming in, a, in an oil refinery for old school telly years ago. Well, it's amazing how that industry works. It's stunning. But it does use a lot of electricity and cobalt. <laughs> Just want to mention that. <laughs> um, the last thing I really want to talk about is China. So we've just done this show in Amsterdam. It was a great success. We were really thrilled because it's always a nervous thing to do a, a show in a foreign territory we don't really understand. We got uh, really, really worked hard to get European car makers to show their cars there. And we had all their cars there because we had people who owned the cars, had them on display. So we have all every, every possible electric car you can possibly buy in Europe was on display there. But none of those manufacturers came. They didn't want to know. So who came? So there were 12 manufacturers. They were Chinese and Tesla and South Korea. So uh, Hyundai, Kia, and then I've got, I'll read them out because the list is extraordinary. I'll read the list out of the people who were there. Neo, Xiaopong, BYD, SAIC, Wuling, Geely, Zika, Great Wall Motor, GAC, Ion, Cherry, Changjiang, and Hozong. I hadn't heard of three quarters of those. They are really good cars. They're much, much cheaper than anything we make in Europe or North America. They, are, they have really good software. Their battery technology is about five years advanced about anything that's made in Europe. We don't, because the thing is, we don't even make batteries in Europe. The cars that, we, that you buy, if you buy an Audi or a BMW electric car, the batteries come from China anyway. They are a massive existential threat to the European and North American car market. Now, at the moment, the North American car market is protected because you can't, because of the um, Inflation Reduction Act, they've restricted imports of Chinese vehicles. But here and in Europe, there's no restrictions like that. These cars are, they're kind of better. I mean, if you drive the uh, BYD Seal, which I just did recently, same size, same weight, same range as a Tesla Model 3, just better. And about $4,000 cheaper. Now, that is why Tesla have dropped their prices recently, because this is serious, proper, genuine. It's beautifully, beautifully made car. The software is really good. The, 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 the pedal mapping, as it's called. So when you push your foot on the throttle, the way the car moves is, is beautifully done. And there are versions of cars where you touch the throttle and then it jerks a bit and then it goes, and then it goes. This is nothing, none of that. You can rest, you can gently dent the leather of your beautiful handmade shoes on the exquisite pedal and the car will just, it's like you're being pushed along by a duvet. It's just <laughs> extraordinary. And if you turn it to sport, it's totally the other way around. You touch that throttle and you're doing 43 miles an hour. So it has that, that subtlety to it. They've really got it down. And so the challenge for European car makers is monstrous. I do not know how they're going. I think in all our lifetimes in this room, we're going to see big brands we've heard of all our lives literally go bankrupt or get taken over and bought by Chinese companies. And I think that's such a tragedy. And when I walk around the museum, as I did earlier on today, we have this incredible legacy in this country of brilliant engineering prowess, of brilliant invention, of incredible engineering skill. And it's kind of in our DNA. And why aren't we doing that now? Why aren't we making the best electric cars in the world? Why aren't we having a massive battery factory that's bigger than anywhere else in the world? And we don't do that anymore. We've shipped all our manufacturing to China for the last basically 40 years. 
And that's why we have low CO2 from our electricity, because we don't make anything anymore. We make tanks and bombs and guns. We're really good at that. <laughs> We're really good at that, but that's sort of kept slightly quiet. Uh, but we don't make the things we used to make, and I think that is a tragedy, and that was, in a way, one of the motivating forces of doing the Scrap Heap Challenge, was how do we get young people excited and interested in engineering and in manufacturing and in understanding how things are made. So I've spent the last, basically, 30 years of my... Is it 30 years? 20, certainly 25 years of my TV career trying to communicate that. So how, I did a, sh a series called... Um, how do they do it, which was how things are made, what they're made from, what, what we, what, where, you know, even to the most banal stuff, tea bags, bloody amazing. I went to Lipton's and I sat in front of the tea bag making machine and they were filming me watching because it is the most extraordinary thing. It's old, it's really old thing. It's just a big wheel and the paper comes in there and the tea comes up and then it goes, <laughs> folds it and then it goes, <laughs> and then a little staple and then it goes, ah, oh, it's a tea bag. I had to be literally physically dragged away because I was just like, what can you It's amazing. And then, oh, look at, oh, you have to watch it for a long time to see how it folds. I love seeing tea bags made. I woke up one morning going, this is the most boring day of my life. I've got to go and see how they make fiberglass insulation. Oh, God, it was like massive factory in South Wales. And then you go in there and it's going, God, it's hot, because it was in the winter we were filming it. It's such a hot building. Going, God, what's in there? And they, he went, uh, something like 800 tonnes of molten glass. Molten glass is quite hot. I'll just say that now. So they opened the little thing, and it's like, oh, and it's this white, it's like, you couldn't even look at it, it was so bright. And that molten glass goes through a, uh, exactly the same technology as makes candy floss. It's exactly the same. It's a spinning thing with little holes in, and the glass comes out, and it, it turns into fluffy fiberglass. And, and then you say, he said, put your hand in there. I went, you're kidding, I've just seen it, it's really hot. No, it's, it's cooled. You put your hand in there, it gets covered in fiberglass. It's warm, but it doesn't burn you. It's amazing. And then there's this roll of fiberglass. Why the hell am I talking about fiberglass? I'm meant to be talking about cars, but it was amazing to see that. <laughs> and we don't know, you know, the general public don't know how this stuff's made. We don't know how batteries are made. We don't know how cars are made. We don't know how anything's made. Get in an aeroplane. How's an aeroplane made? Fucking terrifying. I want to know how it's made. I want to see it. I was very lucky to go around the Boeing factory in Seattle with Craig Charles, who was... You couldn't, I can't express how uninterested he was in seeing how aeroplane. I don't care, Bobby. I don't care. I want to get in the plane, get drunk, fall asleep, get out the other end. And I went, no, but look, look at the framework. I didn't know it was that big. We saw, saw 747s being built. It's amazing. He was bored shitless. He went out the back and had a fag, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> He's very good. Uh, Craig, I would love to do an engineering show with Craig Charles because he would be so uninterested. So if you could get him even moderately interested, you knew you'd really achieve something. Chris Barry, I know, did a talk here. I've just got to quickly tell you this. When I drive into the, 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 the studio at Pinewood, and when we were making Red Dwarf a few years ago, I drove in in my Tesla Model 3, beautiful, slid it into the parking space. It's got my name on it like proper actors. It says Robert Lula there. Next to it is Chris Barry. I wasn't allowed to park in my space because he got his Jag there, and I wasn't allowed to put my hideous, vile electric car anywhere near his Jag because his Jag may be solid by the experience of being near an electric car. So I had to park it up the end where the lighting man normally, and the lighting man had to park in my space. <laughs> so that's Chris. <laughs> He's lovely. We do get on, really. He's so funny. Uh, how long have I talked for? Got no idea. No. <laughs> I, because I want you to have your little your mince pies. Uh, uh, I've kind of got through the key points I wanted to make. I'm hoping that you've got some questions for me. Um, sorry, I suppose the, let, let's end with the, the sort of key points. I think the key points are that electric cars, in the next two years, electric cars will be cheaper to buy than a petrol car. Electric cars are much, much cheaper to run than an electric car. Electric cars are much, much cheaper than a petrol car. Sorry. Electric cars are much, much cheaper to service. This is a really important thing I never thought of until I'd had a car for a long time. So I have a Nissan Leaf built in 2011. So it is now 12 years old. I have spent essentially nothing servicing it. A few, maybe a couple of hundred quid. I bought new tires. It's had uh, new brake pads on the front, but not the discs. It's got the original discs. And I've now learned that what you do when you have an electric car like an old Nissan Leaf is you drive it out in the morning, you drive about a mile 
when you're up at speed, you make sure no one's behind you and you pump the brakes like mad because the brakes will rust up because you don't use them. So the brake pads last hundreds of thousands of miles. The tyres last longer in electric cars, not less, as has often been reported. That car has had no mechanical work done to it whatsoever, nothing. There's not been oil changes, filter changes, fan belts, catalytic, nothing. It doesn't have any of those things. It's got one moving part in the engine. A four-cylinder engine has about 2,000. What do those parts do? They move. What does that mean when you've got lots and lots of bits of metal that move next to each other? They create friction. That causes heat. That wastes energy. You know, an electric motor is hugely efficient. A petrol engine is hugely inefficient. Lovely, fabulous. There's nothing better than the sound of a throbbing V8. I totally get it. But now I hear that. Yeah, brilliant. It's just wasting all that fuel you're putting into it. It's running at about 20% efficient, which means for every pound you put in the tank, 20p makes that engine run. And about 15p makes you move along. It's just not tenable anymore, I don't think. You put a pound in an electric car and about 85 pence of that pound moves you along the road. And that's the difference. And it moves you along the road much, much further than a petrol car. I did a talk in Coventry where I was rude about Range Rover Sports. It was a bad idea because Coventry is very near the JLR headquarters. And there were quite a lot of gentlemen in the, or in the space who worked at JLR. And I'd said something like, you know, at best, a, a Range Rover Sport does about 30 miles to the gallon, which is what it says on their website. And they came up and they went, Robert, you were really wrong about that. That was just nowhere near accurate. I went, well, oh, it's what it said on the website. He went, no, it's about eight miles to the gallon because no one, <laughs> no one who's got a Range Rover Sport drives at the speed limit. They thrash them, we know, because we get them back and they're completely shagged out. They were very, very honest about it. Um, so those things are, are the arguments for. The arguments against, I think, are about our relationship with cars. Do we really need to own them? Should we not? initially invest in better public transport, in better cycling infrastructure, in cleaner, quieter cities. It's difficult in a place like this, which is dedicated to the, the fabulous aspects and the, the romantic and wonderful aspects of our motoring history that I absolutely adore and I don't denigrate it. I think the museum here is fabulous and I love that. And I'm bizarrely a honorary member of the Bugatti Owners Association whose headquarters are at the Prescott Hill Climb in Gloucestershire which is very near where I live and that is because I've done a talk there and I begged them to keep their cars going to make sure that, they, that they're, they're available for the next generation because I want children like our great grandchildren to say to their granddads, our children maybe, granddad did you really sit in a car in a machine that had a, a block of metal in the front where there were explosions that, caused, that, that created toxic gas, and if you breathe that gas in, you die. And you go, well, it, it wasn't really like that, but sort of. <laughs> it is just bonkers when you think about how, how normal that, that stuff is. And we, it is all, it, I, you know, I'm very torn between the two things, because I do appreciate uh, the, the engineering and the skill that's, that's made uh, combustion engines go from hopelessly inefficient and chronic in 1902 to the amazing, I mean, they last forever now. I mean, there's, you can't denigrate that. That is an extraordinary advancement. One of the things I've completely forgotten to talk about is New York in 1908, which, was a, which is where I was going to start, John. I blame you. Everybody else does. Do they? Well, that's fine. Let me just do quickly, because it is fascinating. 1908 in New York City, so in Manhattan, there were, I don't know how many, many, many hundreds of horse-drawn uh, taxis, cabs, whatever you want to call them. But there were 872 mechanical uh, taxis, and they were all electric. That's the only ones that were on the roads. 872, a lot. They had charging posts on the street where you could park the taxi and you've got a big, uh, it wasn't a, a wire, it was a braided uh, sort of, that must have been dangerous as hell thing. Uh, and it had a spade connector. They've still got some in museums in America. And they, you slide the spade into the front of the car, and that was the connection, and that would charge it from the street charger. But also, they had battery swapping stations, one in Soho in the south of New York and one in Harlem. And, and the story is that the taxi would drive in, and two blokes 
would push the, the battery, they'd un disconnect it first of all, push the battery tray onto a trolley that was the other side, that would be wheeled off and plugged into charge, they'd have another trolley this side, they'd push the battery pack in, they'd reconnect it and it'd go out and they could do that in under a minute. And that gave that, that taxi a range of 80 miles in 1908. And the reason it's recorded as 1908 is that's the, the year that the first petrol-powered taxi was introduced onto the streets. It was the council had allowed it to happen. It was a hand-cranked, just sounds so wrong now, doesn't it? Hand-cranked uh, petrol car, and it had two seats and uh, a demijohn, a glass bottle of gasoline, strapped to the, the back with a leather strap. Uh, and that was how the, so it was gravity fed, <laughs> didn't have a fuel pump. <laughs> how do you get the fuel into that? You just have it up higher. And that was right behind where the passengers sat. And that car backfired so much that it freaked out all the horses. It broke down twice and it was producing so much smoke because it was misfiring that they banned it after one day. It lasted one day. And that is, you know, you just think that is how history could have changed. What happened, and I think this is the cr crucial thing as to why we don't drive electric cars for the last 100 years, is because a man called Charles F. Kettering. So Charles F. Kettering worked for Henry Ford. They, he had helped Henry Ford develop the electric Model T. Who knew? They made 5,000 electric Model Ts. I had no idea. And they were... Um, so he developed the batteries and the control system, which were all obviously very analog and mechanical, and the electric motors. And Henry Ford was pretty convinced that combustion engines were the future, but he wasn't 100%. He did think that electric uh, mobility could, was a possibility. Thomas Edison had an electric Model T in his house. At, and the reason I can remember this name very easily is because he lived in Llewellyn Mansion. So I can always remember that. And that's still there. It's a museum, and you can still see the charging system, and it looks absolutely lethal. Uh, it looks really dangerous. And so he could charge his Model T Ford from a wind turbine in his back garden. What a massive hippie Thomas Edison was. Uh, but Charles F. Kettering had a family friend who had a petrol car and he was cranking it up one morning and it backfired and the crank handle flew out and pierced his chest and killed him. Charles F. Kettering was so appalled by this, went to the funeral, it was a long story about it. There's a book all about Charles F. Kettering's journey. And he developed a small electric motor that you strap on the side of a petrol engine called a starter motor, and that meant that petrol cars could be used by anyone. Before that, electric cars were really marketed to women, because you get in an electric car, there's the Baker Electric, uh, uh, Jay Leno has got one in, in America. You, I've sat in one, you sit in it, it's got a steering wheel, there's a Bakelite switch there, you go, chum, that's on, and then you want to go forward, chum, that's it. That's how hard it is to drive that electric car, really simple. Petrol cars, old petrol cars, you can see them in the museum. The phenomenal amount of controls and levers and special things and timing. Oh, my God. You know, really, really difficult at that time. And you had to wind it by hand. So as soon as there was a starter motor, that, I think, swung it. So then they just the Model T Ford, and we all know the, the rest of that history. So Charles F. Kettering is either a genius or an evil something, rude. <laughs> I think he's probably a genius. And uh, I, I, I was really fascinated when I came across him and Llewellyn Mansion. So I went to visit Llewellyn Mansion. I have friends who live in a place called Hastings on Hudson, the other side of the river from New Jersey. Uh, Llewellyn Mansions is in New Jersey, where Thomas Edison lived. He had, an, he had the first electric toaster in America. So he, his wind turbine generated power that went into lead acid batteries in the basement, and he had electric lights and an electric toaster. So exciting. And it's still there. You can go and see his electric toaster. But they don't have an electric Model T Ford in his garage. It's just empty, but with lots of terrifying looking. What's that? It's cloth covered wiring. You just think, oh, that was difficult. <laughs> Hand woven <laughs> cloth cover covered wiring. On that note, that little bit of pointless history, I've talked for far too long. Have a break. And then if you've got any questions, do ask them, and I'll do my best to maybe answer them as best I can. Thank you very much. so easy to say, oh my god, I'm not getting one of those electric cars, they all burst into flames. So the Luton car park, the, uh, the, ship, the car transporter ship off the coast of 
Uh, there's about four fires, those are two I can remember now, were all initially reported, even by the BBC, the, the car transporter was, these are electric car fires, and they, none of them were. They were, all, they were, in fact, all diesel vehicles that caught fire. Um, and, and then what transpired, uh, the more we looked into it, and we are going to put something on the page about that. But it's, in fact, plug-in hybrids, you know, statistically, are the most likely to catch fire, which is slightly worrying. Um, but it, when an electric vehicle does catch fire, there was recently a truck fire in uh, Melbourne, Australia, in a, in a, made by a truck company I've been to see, and we've made a program about that, and that burst into flames, and it's really difficult to put it out. And this vehicle has five tonnes of lithium-ion batteries, so that's a big, big battery. It's a big, it was a cement uh, truck. Um, they have another truck, which we're going to film, hopefully, uh, early next year, which is a road train, and that has... 12 tons of batteries <laughs> on board. <laughs> but that is pulling um, uh, 290 tons of iron ore. So in lots of trailers. So it's not one trailer, it's a whole road, like a train. It's a road train. But it's, you know, who knows. So how do you counter uh, those discussions? Because you can't say electric cars never catch fire. Because, of course, they do. Any technology that the human race makes can fail. We all know that very well. Um, uh, but I think the, certainly the next generation of batteries, so BYD, the BYD seal, if you put that car on a bonfire and set fire to it, the car would burn, but the, probably the batteries wouldn't. If you smash a big spike through that battery, it won't burn. They show, they're very happy to show you. They get their battery cells, their, their um, not uh, cylindrical batteries, their uh, plates and they bang big nails through or pickaxe through it and nothing happens, fully charged battery, and they, it doesn't burst into flames. So I think in the next four or five years, the, uh, the notion of a battery fire will be a thing of the past. It just isn't going to happen. But the car could still catch fire because it could have an electrical fault which shorts out, which causes other problems, and cars are made of plastic, and uh, you know, the things can go wrong. So uh, you know, we have to acknowledge that. I think it's very important. But, to say that electric cars are deadly because they all catch fire is a lie. There's no other way of describing it. It's just not true. So there were 2,500 car fires in 2022. They were all in diesel, petrol, and hybrid cars. None of them were in electric cars. So, you know, and there's far more of those cars than there are electric cars. Of course there are. But still, it's a tiny, tiny percentage of electric cars that catch fire. When they do, it's going to be in the Daily Mail. <laughs> it's and the sun <laughs> just is. Is your stop burning stuff going to be able to provide us with the information, not just from burning cars, but all of these false? Yes, cars. so that's the whole idea of it. So uh, we just, well, I was actually with Quentin yesterday, so we're, we're do, he's going to start a podcast in the new year and we're going to release the data that we're collecting now. So we're really busy. So there's a man called Ewan McTurk who's a battery chemist, there's an amazing woman called Hannah. Now, of course, her second name's gone, who's a data research scientist who does, comes up with incredibly well-researched information about things like where does the materials come from? That Hannah make... Fry. Hannah Fry, thank you. Thank you. That's, can you be on the phone whenever I can't remember something? <laughs> What's alarming about Hannah Fry is she's younger than my children, and she's very, very bloody clever. I hate young people and their intelligence. Um, but yes, yeah, so yes, yeah, so that is definitely that's the whole reason we've done it is to. Start. So we're still in the really early stages of, of collating that, but we've had some success. So there's been a recent series of articles in the Guardian, which admittedly is the Guardian, so it's not quite so uh, confrontational in this, on this topic, uh, under uh, uh, exposing the myths, the 21 favourite myths about electric cars, and and the data and the actual information about why they're not real, or they're not, you know. And as I was saying to a gentleman earlier on. The real problem I see with electric vehicles is not technological anymore, it's psychological. And I completely sympathise with that. that, that the, if you've never driven one, then the exact anxiety or the, the worries, and you're not, oh, it's not ready. You know, that's I, completely understandable. But technologically, they do, they're boring. They go from A to B. And they, when they're in B, you can charge them while you're doing something else, and then you drive back to A. You know, that's, it's, that's, that's kind of tedious and boring to even talk about. They have the range, because the human body, my argument is the human body has a range of about, depending on your age, 
about 160 to 220 miles. That's the range of a human body. Then if you don't stop, and I speak as someone who's had a bladder infection that put me in hospital with sepsis, you do not want to go there. You need to get out and piss. <laughs> There's no other way of saying it politely. A doctor told me that. He said, get out of your car, stand up, go into a toilet and piss. It's not good for you to sit. If you imagine, because when people tell me, I drive from Hampshire to the Scottish borders in one, without stopping in my diesel car. That, if you imagine you sit in an armchair at home and you don't move for nine hours, that is not good for your body. You need to get up and have a wee. And while you're weeing, you can charge the car. Uh, well, actually, I'll just quickly, my wife, who has no interest in cars, no interest in renewable energy, no interest in any of those things. She's an artist, she's a creative person. Uh, she doesn't like the Tesla now because it charges too fast, because she plugs it in, goes into the thing, and then it's sending her a message, yeah, it's in, don't stay, they leave your car there too long, it's already charged, and she hasn't bought a coffee and she's just had a wee. So, you know, there's a, there's a downside to, to rapid charging. You need a bit more <laughs> breathing space. Sorry, yes. Yeah. I don't see how that works so easily where I am. No. Where, where are the big wins for this? They are in the big cities. Yeah, I mean, car sharing, I can't help thinking, is a very urban experience, really. I can't see... I, you know, I live quite near our village hall, and I have had sort of little dreams where there's nine little electric cars with charging posts and solar panels at the village hall, and if I ever become a billionaire, I'll pay for it and do it, and it'll be called Llewellyn Hall. <laughs> It's, I, I think the good thing is it's not going to happen. But, you know, that you could sort of almost imagine that in a small... I live in a small village, 28 houses, so, uh, you know, you, but I can't. I would love that to happen. It might happen eventually, but certainly in an urban situation, when you do talk to people who are involved in that world, uh, you know, if you imagine a, a, a street in West London that has 200 cars parked on the, kind of up on the pavement... And then all there for hours and hours and hours. And if you think, well, if those people could probably do exactly what they do with those cars, but with four or five that are at one end in a special block that you charge them in, and they've still got access to those cars whenever they need them, and they're, you know, that, then you would have that street empty and kids could play in it. And there's not, you know, there would be big pluses for us to change our behaviour. And I, I lived in London for 14 years. I arrived in a Morris Thousand van. One of the wheels fell off. I fixed it back on. <laughs> With some glue. No, I had it fixed by a proper mechanic. It passed its MOT. I drove it for 500 metres and the other wheel fell off. So there's the reliability of lovely old British cars. I love that band. It was brilliant. Um, but eventually I got rid of it and I lived in London for probably 13 years without a car and it was fine. And if I needed a car, I'd rent one at the weekend and drive out to some mates or whatever. I used a bike and I used buses and public transport because it was daft. It was such a hassle to have a car in London where you park it and, uh, you know, real nightmare. So not having one was a great advantage. But I now live out in the sticks. So, yeah, it is harder. Um, is there any other questions? Sir? What's a realistic roadmap for reducing HGV emissions? Yeah. Yeah, because they're, they're, so Janus trucks in Australia make huge, bigger trucks than we can have in this country, heavier, and they are electric. And the one that I went in, I had to film it on, a, on Australia Day because that was a public holiday because it's used seven days a week delivering sand to building sites all around southeastern Queensland. It's huge, 96 tonnes it can carry. It's huge. It's a massive thing. You wouldn't be allowed them on the road in this country. And that runs on electricity about 90% of which is generated from the, the, the base where the truck operates from, because they've got massive solar array on the roof of a huge building that charges the batteries in situ. They're not in the vehicle because it swaps the batteries. And when the, ba the truck comes back, they take out the discharged batteries, put in new ones, which takes quite a while. They're using a forklift truck at the moment. They are building a mechanism. Uh, the big setback for them is one of their trucks just caught fire, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Tesla... Of the Tesla Semi. It's just really weird, isn't it? Because if you say semi, I don't know if you use that term. <laughs> the gentleman in the room may. It's embarrassing, and I don't want to go there. Um, uh, but yes, the, the Tesla Semi, though, though it's uh, PepsiCo, isn't it, that are using a few of them 
and their, their fuel savings are off the scale. I mean, it's going to be millions of dollars a year in, save, in fuel savings. Because what, and one of the things they didn't, they kind of knew, but I heard the engineers talking, they were great, they're Tesla engineers, not Elon Musk, actual engineers that helped build that truck. When, that tr when you go down a hill in an electric car, you can get some regenerative braking, and you get at the most about 10% of what you used to go up the hill. So you don't get, it doesn't all come back, but you do get some back. And I've certainly experienced that on a big scale driving across the Alps. That's another story because my wife was so angry when I did it, I won't go into it. But, um, but you can regen a lot when you go down the Alps <laughs> for hours downhill. It's fabulous. Anyway, w when you're in a truck that weighs 60 tons and you're going down a hill, your regen is mind-boggling. It's 1.6 megawatts though that truck is generating, which is going into the batteries, which increases the range. Those trucks go further than they were designed to go, not less far, which is quite interesting. When it's fully loaded, when it's not fully loaded, it's not the same. So when it's loaded up, it, they, they produce an enormous amount of power. So there are advantages, whether battery electric heavy trucks are going to be the answer, I don't know. I wouldn't want to speculate. Certainly vans, delivery vans, there's absolutely no doubt. They will, they already are. I mean, if you, if you spend any time in London, you'll see dozens of electric vans. They're just, they're cheaper to run. So if you're not doing 500 miles a day in a, in a van to deliver something, at the moment you can use an electric one and it's, it's cheaper. You know, I think that's the thing. And I think the trucks, have, it's, it's going to be down to battery technology. And, and the new uh, versions of battery technology coming out. All the buses that we use in the UK are all made in China, but they're very reliable. They haven't burst into flames yet. It could happen any time. The Daily Mail are there ready. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so I, I hope that it's... That I hope that the trucks will be electric. Maybe hydrogen is, the, is an answer for, for trucks, because then you could have dedicated depots that can refuel them and all those things, but it's really expensive to build all that stuff. And just quickly, here's the, the energy breakdown. If you generate one kilowatt hour of electricity from a wind turbine, and that goes down the wire and through an inverter and into a car, you probably lose 25% going into the car. So you get, so for every four kilowatt hours you're generating, you're, you're, you've got maybe three kilowatt hours in the car. When you've got when you produce hydrogen by splitting water using the same, like you put four kilowatt hours of energy into the water, you get just under one kilowatt hour of energy, usable energy, out of that. So there's a massive, it's a massive waste. It can be done, and if we're going to use hydrogen, it has to be done like that, but it's not very efficient. It's much more efficient to put it in a battery. Um, anyway, sorry, there was, uh, yes, sir, in the back. I, I just realised I haven't been repeating the questions. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I would have totally forgot. I'll try with you. Yeah, we hear stories about how many, how many power stations we have to build to provide the electricity. Can you say something about that? How many power stations would we have to build? I think it's, I mean, it's, it's very speculative at the moment. I, I tend to trust the engineers and the scientists and the administrators that run the national grid. So they say none. We don't need any more because we have a huge capacity at the moment in our grid system to cover these incredible peaks. And this time of year is the absolute, the classic example. So the, the, uh, our, our demand in early November is when everyone turns up because we're all depressed and miserable and it's winter and it's cold and oh, it's horrible. So you turn everything on. So there's these huge peaks. Well, for 90% of the year that we consume electricity, we're nowhere near that much, but we can produce that much. That is a huge amount. So it's 65 gigawatts, something like that. But in, on the average time, we're about 22 gigawatts, so way, way lower. And that 22 gigawatts runs, ev runs the country, and then everything goes to poo with those big spikes. So that's how our generation, I'll do it your way around, that's the mid midnight. It goes like that, goes up a bit in the morning, goes right down in the day. Weird. I think that's weird. Massive spike, and then it drops again. That's 24 hours of our grid. And you can see it when you go to the National Grid Control Room. It's, it's visual on the wall. And what they're saying is they want to get rid of that peak and spread that load. They want to make it so that instead of doing this every day, it does this. And that is much easier to manage and maintain. And the one thing that would really, really help that is electric ground transport, because you can spread that demand 
over that 24-hour period. So that big drop in the, in the night time, when we're all asleep, is really difficult to manage because they've got generating capacity nuclear. You can't turn nuclear down or up. It's either on or, as one nuclear engineer said to me, you're trying to overtake me as I run away from the power station, which I thought was, I thought was not good PR for the nuclear industry. So, I mean, obviously you can turn them off, but it's incredibly expensive and inefficient. It's a terrible thing to do. So they're constant. They're producing a constant amount of power. And then things like wind, obviously, are wibbly-wobbly up and down all over the place. Uh, last, late last week, we were 69% of all our electricity was coming from offshore wind, which I think is we're not, we haven't ever broken 70%. 69%. This is in the daytime of a weekday, not in a weekend or a Sunday morning or something like that. It's a, it's, we've got a lot of wind turbines that we don't see because they're out in the middle of the ocean. So we're very far ahead of that. We're a bit behind China now because they've gone do lally about it. But, you know, so we can do that. So what we have to be and what all the engineers are saying, we need to be about 150%. We need to have days where 150% of our power is coming from wind. So then on the really quiet days, it's 70%. And we're not there yet. So I don't know. I think we would have to increase our capacity. But what is really clear is we have to increase our grid connectivity and, and modernise the grid. To, that's far more urgent than increased generation. We have enormous generating capacity that we don't use. When we've got a gas turbine that isn't being used, do you know what we do? We all pay that company to have that gas turbine on standby, which is sensible because we need it when there's these peaks. But we're paying a lot of money for them to literally not produce electricity. So we need to somehow modernise the way we generate electricity and use it. And some people, not me, because I don't know enough about it, but some people who are proper, clever, intelligent people <laughs> say electric cars would really help. And batteries in your house. And big grid batteries. like They've got one in Oxford. Huge, huge grid batteries really help. There was a man at the right at the back. Yes, can we hear the story about going down the Yamps? Okay. <laughs> can we hear the story about going down the hill in the Yamps? First time I drove a Tesla Model S in Europe, so quite a few years ago, with my wife, and we were going on holiday in Liguria in Italy. It's a beautiful. And we were driving down there, and we stayed with some friends in Germany, and then we drove down, stayed in, in the foothills in Switzerland, went for a long walk in the mountains. It was beautiful. Then we drove to... Um, Damn, can't remember the name. It's a beautiful Tesla supercharger right underneath the Alps in, uh, in, in uh, Italy. And it's got loads of charges and a big solar canopy. And I always can remember the name, but not today. Anyway, that's there. And we're here in Switzerland. So there's two ways of getting there. I didn't tell my wife this because she didn't know, but I, she doesn't look at maps. They're boring. They're not paintings. And so I said, well, let's go over the San Bernard Pass. It's really beautiful. I've been over it before. You get these amazing views. She went, yeah, all right, whatever. So we drive up the San Bernard Pass. It's really high. And the road in Switzerland is this beautiful, sweeping road with beautiful crash barriers. It's exquisite. It's so smooth. It's like driving on silk. Oh, up we go. We use a lot of electricity because we're really climbing. It's 12,000 feet, I think, 13,000 feet at the top. It's got snow in the middle of summer. It's, that, it's high enough for snow. And the last time I drove over in a really old Volvo, it was a beautiful hot day, and we stood at the top and had a cup of tea and looked at this fantastic view of all the mountains in Switzerland. The day I went up with my wife, a few years later in the Tesla, it was five degrees centigrade at the top. It was piddling with rain. It was like today. You couldn't see anything. You, couldn't see, you wouldn't know you were in mountains. You just thought you were in a miserable suburb of Coventry in the rain. It was grim. Uh, and so she wasn't in the best of moods because it was really cold. So then I, it was really raining heavily, and I went, we, we're stuffed. We've got to go down the hill. And I kind of knew what it was like. You go over the border from Switzerland to Italy, and this super smilk, silky, uh, gold banking funded road stops, and then you get an Italian road. <laughs> no crash barriers, just a cross with some flowers where Giuseppe <laughs> went over the edge in 1967. So many crosses down that road. This is a dangerous switchback road that is essentially a river with actual rocks washing down it. And we're going down in a Tesla. And I'm going, this is not popular. And the missus now very upset. Why are we going this way? Was there another way? And I went, well, there is. It, there's a tunnel. And it takes 14 minutes to go through. And it's flat. And we'd be there by now if we'd gone through the tunnel. 
and I'm just going to use an Australian term now, you fucking wanker, she said to me. <laughs> anyway, at the top of the hill, we had 42 kilometres of range. And we had to get to, I'm going to remember, I, I know when I'm driving home tonight, I'm going to shout out the name of this Italian charger, and I'm so annoyed, I can't remember it. But anyway, that was 98 kilometres away. So there's no way we could do it. When we got to that charger in the end, we had 40 kilometres of range. That's the way the Tesla works. It doesn't add anything. It doesn't add range when you go down the hill. It just stays the same. So it was 42 kilometres for about 75 kilometres. <laughs> you know, it just stayed there because we went down for hours and hours. But five degrees at the top, 33 at the bottom. When we got to the bottom and I bought my wife a bottle of water and a little sandwich, she was much happier and she didn't hate me quite as much as she did when we were at the top. So that's the very tedious story of the going over the Alps. I'll never do it again, I promise. <laughs> yes, sir. Why are we? Why aren't we? Oh, well, we are. I have one at home, an MG4. That's yeah. classic British brand, made in China. <laughs> yeah, so they are coming. No, I, do, I wouldn't say all those are coming to the UK. They're all going to Europe. So if you go to Norway, there's just a huge array of... They always go to Norway first, because Norway's the biggest electric car market in Europe. Uh, so uh, in... That was, another, that was a statistic. It was actually earlier this year. May, I think this year, 90% of new car sales in Norway were electric. 90%. So it's a very small percentage of people now buy combustion cars in Norway. Their charging infrastructure is off the scale. They're everyone, just, they're just everywhere you go. Uh, but uh, I think we will. And we certainly BYD are coming here. So they're the biggest car company after Tesla that only make electric cars. BYD were a battery company. So we've all had BYD batteries. When you had a flip phone or a, a laptop, that would have had BYD batteries in it you know, 25 years ago. So they've been making batteries for a long time. They've only recently started making cars. I saw BYD cars in Geneva Motor Show in 2009, and they were really embarrassing. They were rubbish. They looked terrible. They looked like death traps. Uh, and if you see their cars now, they've employed people from, who worked at Daimler-Benz. They were people at Aston Martin, Jag, uh, trying to think where else. Lots and lots of engineers and car designers have, worked, have gone to China and worked for BYD. So the quality of what they make is completely transformed. So they will come here. Uh, some of them you won't even know. So Polestar, for instance. Swedish Polestar. It's Svenska car. It's very nice. Beautiful cars. They're made in China, but they're designed in Sweden. It's a bit like Apple computers. Designed in California. Made in China. You know, it's kind of that way. So I don't know that we're always going to know. I, I, when I bought the MG, I went, I've never had an MG. This is really cool. I've got an MG. It's made by Geely in China. So they bought up lots of old brands. They bought up lots of uh, European car makers. I don't know what we can do about it. I think we're stuffed, really. You know, they make 90% of the world's batteries are made in China. They've already secured the materials they need in Africa and South America. You know, today, it was some really good news. There's a lake in uh, somewhere in, in uh, not, I, think, I think it is in California. They found a lake that has, three, I think it's 375 million tonnes of lithium. <laughs> they didn't know it was there. Because people haven't looked for it before because we haven't had the demand for it. So there's going to be things like that where we suddenly go, oh, there's a lot of copper in that hill. There's a volcano in Utah that is made of copper. It's billions of tons of copper. So whether they extract it, I don't know. But there is the materials, you know. According to Hannah Fry, thank you for remembering that name, sir, there are way more material on the planet than we can possibly use for electric vehicles. We, we have a huge delay in extracting them and how we mine them and how we use them. And we also have to, have to recycle all of them. Otherwise, just burn oil. You know, that's really... Yes? Oh, thank you. This year's seen some incredible new electric vehicles being unveiled, such as the new Mini Cooper, the hot Hyundai Ionic 5N, MG Cyberster to go on. Just wanted to know with the new year coming up, are there any new electric cars that you're looking forward to seeing most? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to repeat the question. How brilliant I am at talking. No, um, uh, sorry. No, uh, what, what are there electric cars I'm looking forward to seeing? The Cyberster, I must admit, I've not driven it, I've sat in it. It was at Goodwood, wasn't it? And it was just, it's pretty sexy. It's, it, I was impressed. Uh, 
Although, uh, um, I mean, the BYD seal is, you know, will come to the UK next, next year. It's a really impressive car. But then the BYD Atto 3, I think, is much more sensible, which is effectively a sort of golf-sized hatchback. Much more useful, much more sensible. Really, really, they, what they've really got down is energy efficiency. So you're looking at five and a half, six miles to the kilowatt hour. So something like a Jaguar I-Pace, which is a fantastic car, is like two and a half miles to the kilowatt hour. So it's a proper Jag. It just drinks electrons. Uh, you know, and it's amazing. I loved, I've driven an a, a I-Pace all over Europe, and I loved it. But it just used so much more electricity than the other cars we were using. So that energy efficiency thing, you know, the MG5 is, MG4 is really good fuel efficiency, even in the cold. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive. So, but uh, yeah, it's hard not to be impressed with what BYD are bringing out. Uh, uh, Xiaopong, or Xpeng, as we would say it, their cars are very impressive. But the thing, I'm a bit sick of massive SUVs, and they're all kind of doing a bit of that, you know, glamorous, beautiful SUVs. We, we unveiled a car at, in Amsterdam, uh, and I can't remember, the Hayak, I, I don't know how you say it, H-I-A-C, Chinese brand, and it was the size of a London bus. It was a one, two, three rows of six-seater, but super luxury, you know, it would be a hotel would use it to move VIPs, I suppose. But it was massive. I mean, it took about 10 minutes to pull the cloth off because it was just so huge. And those things are just, oh, God, I don't know. I'm, I think they have a role. Yes, sir. It's really important. I mean, the only thing I can think of is, is a, a, a tax per mile, you know, that for the amount you drive. <coughs> the distance you drive, you'll be, you'll be taxed on that. And there's lots and lots of angry debates about that. And certainly, the, I mean, I, uh, Norman Baker, who was transport minister in the coalition government, I ha was, attended a, uh, an event where he was there. And I asked him, I said, how are you going to tax the... So the electricity I get from my solar panels that I charge my car with. He said, we can't. We know we can't. Uh, but we can tax how far you drive. <laughs> and so that was the first time I heard that. I went, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Which, in a sense, is kind of a fairer way of doing it. So if you tax a car because it's a car, and you've got an old, an old car that's a high-polluting car, and you're a poor person, and you have to pay all this tax, and you might not even drive it 4,000 miles. Well, if you're paying to drive it 4,000 miles, you won't pay as much as someone who's got a new car that's rich and poncy and, you know, virtue signalling and drives 50,000 miles a year. They should pay more. They're using the roads more. So in that sense, it's a fairer system, I suppose, you could argue. But it's got to be that. It can't be... You can't tax electricity. And one of the big debates we're going through with Quentin, with... Uh, he also runs Fair Charge, is that we pay 5% VAT on the electricity we pay for at home and 20% VAT on electricity we buy from chargers. And that makes chargers much more expensive. And it's, re it's a really unfair loading on those, on those systems. So that's, a, again, a hot topic. Of, and there are some sympathetic uh, gov people in government that sort of think that isn't right, that it should be reduced. Because that's why, you know, I will always charge at home. If I've got the option, I'll charge at home. I charged at home before I came here tonight, and I'll go back home, and I won't. Because it's too expensive. I'm not going to... OK, it's more complicated than that, because I've got free charging on superchargers. <laughs> so, but uh, that doesn't really count. That's just because I've sold a stupid amount of Teslas through my referral fee code thing. So I get free supercharging forever. <laughs> so it doesn't really count. Yes? My understanding is all new car chargers at home have to have a separate... Oh, I've got two car chargers at home, and neither of them have got. Or, came in a year ago or so. Did it? Yeah. And they, they have to have a separate meter. Separate meter. Why don't I, do? Do other people here know that? No. I didn't know that. I have to. I, that is worrying. I didn't know that, and I know a lot of people who work in who install chargers and uh, has to have a separate meter for the charger. Yeah. Not a, it's not just that it's a smart meter that you put in your house anyway. Separate meter. Mm. Right. Right. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. But I just know people. It's going to be such an easy thing to get around, because you could easily put in solar panels in your house and have run a wire from the, from the uh, inverter to the charger and just like, I'm just charging off. It only uses solar. It's isolated. 
would be, you know, those things are... I've got a, uh, a portable wind turbine that I haven't unboxed yet. It's from Denmark, and I'm going to unbox it and put it up in my garden. <laughs> and you can, you could trickle charge, the, probably the Nissan Leaf. It would take about two months. <laughs> <laughs> you can charge phones with it or run lights in, when you're camping. It's for camping, but it's a sort of, it's quite big. It's a huge, but I don't know, you couldn't carry it in your rucksack. You'd need something bigger than that. But I'm really intrigued by it. So the Danes are so good at wind, you know. Uh, uh, yes, sir, at the back. He did an episode out of home, I think it was, and it was not quite zero carbon, but it was almost off-grid at some point. In the summer, not in the winter, yeah. Factory, yeah, so, uh, we, yes, uh, so my house is uh, uh, a high... Uh, medium stress experimental uh, dwelling unit. So I have an a extraordinarily t tolerant and loving wife who's not that interested in any of it. Um, so we, we're 100% electric in the summer. So last summer was a really good example. We did 49 days where we lived in the house and washing machines and cooking and heating water, everything, and, and charging cars without using any grid electricity at all. And I was going for 50 days so I could write a blog called 50 Days Off the Grid. And my daughter returned home uh, in, the, in my, Nissan, my Nissan Leaf when I wasn't there, plugged it into the wrong fucking charger and used grid electricity. <laughs> Screwed the whole thing up. I'd done 40 nights of real careful energy management, checking the app all the time. Don't, 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 don't plug it in there. Put it in here. All that stuff, driving my wife absolutely mad. So it can be done, but not, I mean, in the winter. But what we do... The, the, my main aim is to never use grid electricity between about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and about 7 o'clock at night. So that I don't use. And now Octopus are doing this, uh, Octopus Energy are doing a thing where they encourage you to reduce your usage at that time and you get effectively a sort of small amount off your electricity bill. And they've done that and it's made a huge difference. It's like a whole gas turbine doesn't need to be turned on to produce that electricity because the demand drops by a couple of gigawatts, which is impressive when you do that. And a little bit of energy management like that, this is why the grid, are t the national grid are talking about we don't need m masses more. We just need a much more intelligent way of using electricity. That's, that's a r really key thing. So that's kind of, in the winter, I really do that. But in the summer, it is, we have 12.5 kilowatts of solar. So some ground mounted, some on the roof. So it is way above the average for a, a house. You know, rooftop solar is usually three, four kilowatts. And we've got 12. But that's so I can charge cars. So I did do over 10,000 miles last year, 2022, with no, not paying for the elect electricity, effectively. Uh, the, the, all the electricity that went in the cars for that distance was from solar. So that can be done. And that can be done on a much, much bigger scale commercially and in car parks and at motorway services. And that's kind of, you know, and it's always going to be, particularly here in the summer. But one of the things we do have in the summer is long days. And we produce electricity for a long time. And, th and that's why they have solar in Norway. Because in the summer, their day is basically the whole bloody day, 24 hours, you know. I mean, they, so they're producing enormous amounts of solar in the summer and then absolutely shag all in the winter. So you have to find them, but they produce more wind in the winter. But, you know, we, we, it's a, I think it's a fascinating, difficult disruptive challenge and it's going to not it's not all going to work some of it's going to be an absolute disaster but it feels like it's a challenge that's worth tackling and there's i'm so grateful there's amazing young engineers that are fascinated by it that want to go into that world to try and find ways of storing energy of shifting load demand all those sort of things are really really interesting uh for someone like me yes sir We have a government, did you say, to, that are capable of Yeah. I'm trying to be a good Democrat that thinks that... I do think we <laughs> desperately... I'm unlike uh, sort of weird billionaires who think we don't need any government and if you're poor, you should be shot. Um, I think that we do need government, but I, don't, I think there is such a, an important role for business. I, want, I don't want us to subsidise charges. I don't want us to subsidise electric cars as taxpayers. I don't want to do that. If you want an electric car, buy one or lease one and don't come to me and say, can I have 10,000 pounds off? No. Get a, you know, get a job. 
Can, I say again? Can you get yourself elected? <laughs> no. You imagine how long I'd last <laughs> if I was in government. Yes, there are, yeah. And that's why we have the 40-year 40, 40 exemption from tax and MOT and everything else. Yeah. It's self-interest. And it's yeah. a very powerful lobby in the current government. Yeah. So they will fight you to nil. Yeah, they probably will. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think we should always acknowledge that the biggest, most rapacious, most aggressive, most well-funded, most powerful corporate body on the planet is the oil and gas industry doesn't matter what else you argue about. Those guys have got the levers in. They've got the backhanders. They've got the, you know, they have, the, they have a lot of power. And, and they are spreading the negative stories that we've been talking about at a, at a level that is unimaginable. They are spending billions of dollars every year uh, delaying. It's a, it's a very simple tactic. It's been done before by the tobacco industry, by the asbestos industry. By, by unleaded petrol, they fight and fight. They can delay and delay for 10 years, 15 years, while they still make money. That's, their, that's the role of the lobbyist. Is they know they can't win, but they're delaying it. And that's where I think the real danger is for the rest of us, that they will not give in. They will fight really dirty. And they've got so much money and so much power, and so much power over our governments. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a government that wasn't having to kowtow to the Saudis to, to the, I think uh, what happened with Russia invading Ukraine really woke people up and going, hang on a minute, we're giving, we're giving him loads of money every day for our oil and gas. That doesn't feel right. You know. In the last year, they delayed the target by five years, didn't they? Yeah, and, yes. And they'll keep doing that. If, if they continue in power, yes. I mean, the, the Labour government have already stated they were, going to, they were going to reintroduce the 2030 ban on, on combustion engine sales. So they've said that, so... They, and they might all go, I have... It's uh, easy to say in opposition. What is that? It's, that it's easy, easy to say it's absolutely, I absolutely agree with you. And I mean, that's you a, the one advantage of, being, of getting to this age is that you know there are a bunch of lying shysters. That's really important to remember. <laughs> and we've heard it all before, and I have, you know, so I have no allegiance to uh, uh, any side. I think I've got to stop, haven't I? Well, oh my God, I've got to go home. It's time to take one more quick one question. One more question. <laughs> one more. <laughs> yes, sir. During your lecture, uh, you said nothing negative about electric cars. Why is that? Uh, there's, there are, there's so many people that are very happy to jump into that role <laughs> and, and spend hours saying very negative things about electric cars. I, but I did say right at the beginning they won't save the world, and I don't think they will. And I think there are negative things about electric cars. They're still cars. They take up space in our world. You know, if there's a, if you can still have a traffic jam and it's all electric cars. It will be a cleaner traffic jam, but still a traffic jam. It's a really stupid <laughs> way of moving from A to B. So they're not perfect. They are better, I would argue. That's all. They are better than, than, uh, than having millions of, 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 you know, boring combustion cars. I'm not talking about the beautiful cars that are here or the beautiful cars that some of you, you know, maintain and look after. That's a different species, and that's, they've got to be looked after. But, you know, a, a sort of boring old diesel Audi is just a dirty, inefficient, clanky old piece of poo, <laughs> I think. You know, and I think an electric Audi, for all its failings and annoyances, and it's massive and it's heavy, it's still better. So if someone's going to buy a bloody SUV, one, you're a tosser, but two, get an electric one, because you'll be slightly toss less <laughs> if you do that. But, but there are, there's plenty of negative things about it. You know, I took, did mention it. You know, you've got to dig up tons and tons of material and transport it and refine it and make it into batteries. But, but show me one litre of recycled diesel or petrol and I'll change my mind. I have seen batteries that are made from other batteries. In, by 2025, Apple have stated publicly that none of the cobalt in any of their products will be freshly dug. It will all be from old Apple products that they've recycled. We have to do that. If we don't do that, this whole exercise is a waste of time. So we have to live in a circular economy for everything we use. We cannot carry on extracting oil, turning it into plastic, using it once with the milk and then throwing it away and then re recycling it, which is called crushing it and burning it. You know, it's just, that's, it's unsustainable the way we live now. Even when I was a kid, we didn't buy plastic bottles with milk. It came in a bloody milk bottle. 
that you washed and you sent back. You know, those simple systems have been overridden. Now, why did that happen? Because the fossil fuel industry have got some fucking levers and they're going to make us buy plastic cans of bastards. And it's their fault. We don't have a carbon footprint. They have a carbon footprint. They've tried to load that onto us. We should be furious with the fucking fossil fuel industry. I shouldn't say any more because I'll be arrested. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.